Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I keep getting a word this morning in my own spirit, and the word is sufficiency. Amen. Sufficient in the Christ. Hallelujah. He's made me sufficient. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Competent. Able. Balanced in Him. Hallelujah. Sufficient. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. God's speaking this to my own spirit this morning. My sufficiency is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's made me sufficient this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Independent in that sense of circumstances and everything else as I am dependent and sufficient in Him. Hallelujah. My sufficiency is of Christ this morning. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He's the answer. He's my answer. He's my life. For me to live is Christ this morning. Praise God. It's so wonderful to just acknowledge Him, who He is, what He's done. Amen. His ability, His enabling in our lives. Glory to God. He's wonderful this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're looking unto Him who's the author and the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. Praise the Lord. Amen. This morning, Brother the Sexton is going to be sharing the word with us. This evening, Sister Barbara Massey will be ministering and taking the service. And Lord willing, uh, just for whatever the Lord has for us. But I believe that I was meditating on this this morning as I was seeking the Lord some. And I like to see uh, our Sunday nights, Sunday night meetings develop, uh, be at the, a time or opportunity for the development of the body here and a functioning of the body. Amen. This, this thought of being sufficient, see, sufficient in Christ is also he's made us functionable in him. Hallelujah. With his ability and his and his enablings, functionable. And we want to uh, trust the Lord. I, I'm going to talk it over, Brother Taylor. I, th I believe this is the expression, the burden of his heart, so we can believe. I understand that a lot of us are immature. And so, because of our immaturity, it's sometimes a little difficult to function in body ministry the way we'd like to. But we're going to believe God for development and trust God so that we can begin to function and, uh, and begin to see a, a, a flowing in this direction. <laughs> Praise God. So we trust the Lord that our Sunday evening meetings can be geared in that and what, however the Lord would direct and so on. And we might appoint someone to speak or, or a student or, or what have you, but we want to, or we might not, and just, just to believe the Lord and, and uh, work and function together. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. We want to welcome Sister Joanne Cook home again. She's back with us. Arrived last night. So glad to see Sister Joanne. Brother Wilbur, would you lead us in prayer this morning and just take these requests? Let's just stand and agree together this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our Father, we address you in prayer. Yes. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Approaching the throne of grace through the shed blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Lord, we have a standing in this blood and His sacrifice in the new covenant. We're standing here in your presence as the household of God. Some of our members are sick and suffering, have various difficulties. Lord, we want to thank you and praise you for the many miracles we have seen with our eyes. Some were instant, Lord, and some took place in a short while, but we saw your miracles in the past. We cannot imagine the New Testament church functioning without miracles, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We believe, as our fathers in the faith did, in a 100% supernatural Christianity. Yes. Lord, and we believe we need more, and you would have more of the supernatural yes. power that belongs to you to be made manifest. So, Lord, we thank you and praise you for saving many, for healing many, for doing all manner of miracles in our generation. We can truly testify before your throne, Father. We have seen your power. We have seen your glory. We have heard your voice. Yes. We have stated your purpose. And though imperfectly, we have apprehended that we're moving that way, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's an understanding of your kingdom. Yes. And there are those who are in your kingdom and those who are functioning, Father. Yes. We thank you and we praise you. Thank you, Lord. So as we hear the request this morning, Father, we speak the names of Sister Annette Marsnick before your throne and Sister Bobby's mother in Detroit and Brother Barnabas in the hospital. Yes. We feel very confident that you are active in their cases, Lord. That not only do they have a consulting physician who is earthly, but they have a consulting physician who is heavenly. We do not pretend to know exactly what your purpose is yet, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you will lay a burden on members of the body here this morning. That you will cause the various members to be as wheels in the kingdom machinery. They will be operative and they will be put in gear. They will begin to grasp or mesh with the situation in such a way that we will know that your answer will be made manifest. But we pray in these cases and these grandparents who were mentioned, and the, the other requests, Lord, and the ones that have not been spoken, Yes, Lord. Very, very gravely and seriously, we pray, Lord, that yes. you will do something in applying your miraculous energy to their needs. Hallelujah. 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 Thank Hallelujah. you, Father. Thank you, Father. Praise God. We pray for prayer, Lord. Yes, Lord. We pray for prayer in individuals. We pray that there may be prayer meetings. Yes. We pray that there be, may be an approach to God that's other than religious. Yes. Other than Pentecostal, Lord. Yes. Something that's more foundational and basic. Yes. Where we come to you barefaced with our needs. We say, Father, we have great needs this day. We also confess we have a great God with great provision. Yes. So we confess need on the part of humanity. But in the part of your kingdom functionaries, we confess sufficiency. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, we say you are enough for Annette. Yes. You're enough for Brother Barnabas. You're enough for our sister in Detroit. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Touch their spirits and open them that, yes. that, the, that the gates may be open for your entrance into their hearts in a new way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we would even pray for healing virtue. Thank you, Lord. We pray for the glory of God. We pray for revival, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. Yes, Father. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Praise your Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God, my Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory Amen. to God. Amen. Amen. Praise Thank you, Lord. From South Dakota, Aberdeen, and Brother Sexton has come to join the faculty here at Pinecrest, and it's a real joy to have our brother with us, and we've looked for his arrival with anticipation, knowing that He's sent of the Lord. That's the main thing. God sent him and joined him uh, to us and with us. And Brother Saxon, come and just take your liberty. Amen. I think I should have to say that I'm nearly overwhelmed as I approach this mountain. I don't think there's ever a time when I felt more like a speck than I do this morning. Perhaps you couldn't understand that because 
that you haven't had my background. And uh, I hope that you aren't taking for granted what God is doing in your midst, what God seeks to initiate in the body of Christ here. It's quite a few years now that I was privileged to uh, share in a great outpouring of the Spirit in Canada. And I see the same features here that were existent there. And I feel so unworthy and so diminutive and so weak. I can fully appreciate the verse that Brother Nevis referred to. But uh, I was thinking only of the first part, which goes like this, for we are not sufficient of ourselves. And I felt that very deeply, that we certainly aren't sufficient, and particularly in the presence of God, I like this, with a sense of God's approbation as it exists here. And for 20, for 30 years, I have yearned to see God's sovereignty loosed by men so that his will could truly be done. For every revival of the past has been arrested because man has handled it and God withdrew because of human assumption in matters that pertain to divine affairs. Right. And may you and I as his servants so dedicate ourselves that we may safeguard what God has initiated here. Because this can have reverber reverberation throughout the whole body of Christ on earth where he can find vessels that are conditioned by the cross to really allow him to flow uninhibitedly through them. Praise be to his wonderful name. I worship him and I glorify him. And ever since the time I left Canada, we pastored there in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan for several years. And ever since that time, I've sought what I experienced there. I pursued it. Uh, but God didn't permit me to have it in my church or among those that were around me. I ministered it, I taught it, I, it was a cry of my heart. But somehow God seeks to uh, incorporate within us in a subjective way what we have embraced in terms of revelation and light. God first takes us up in revelation and then he brings us down into the uh, what one might call participation so that light becomes life. It's not merely an objective thing, a visionary thing, but it becomes inward. It must be wrought out in the crucibles, in cross-bearing, so that it is indeed reality in terms of the power of his resurrection. And frankly, I hope you don't misunderstand me, but I feel smashed. I mean it. I feel smashed. I feel so weak. And I hope that there are some of you younger believers here who can't appreciate what I'm saying, that you're not offended. I remember the verse of St. Paul has said, let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. That spoke to me many years ago, this tremendous stewardship of the mystery of Christ. 
and the importance of our being stewards who are such on the basis of our being tried and proven. I think of how Jesus said to Peter, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. That's what ministry is. It's God who imparts to us revelation representing keys which unlock the manifold wisdom of God. And how great is that? How great is that stewardship that God calls men and women into. I, I think of another portion where the disciples rock, uh, as they walked down the road to Emmaus and Jesus accosted them and he told them that they were foolish and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. And they said, uh, as they, as, uh, after Jesus had departed from them, one of the most uh, difficult things for the disciples in those days was that Jesus kept appearing and disappearing. Suddenly he was here. And then they turned and he had disappeared. That's a token of what we shall be. Praise the Lord. And they said, Did not our hearts burn within us as he opened unto us the scripture? <coughs> That's what ministry is. That's all it is, is opening scripture. Praise his wonderful name. Thank you. And uh, so I, I come here in fear and trembling. And uh, I wouldn't be here unless I was drawn here. I'd have went the other way. I mean, inside me there was something that, uh, I don't know how to say it, but inside me I didn't want to come because I didn't feel worthy, because I didn't feel uh, that I could. And I can't. I can't. But I truly feel that through and through. And uh, I feel, uh, I hope you don't mind the repetitive statements, but I, I feel so unworthy to be involved in what God's doing here. Because from the past, I am able to determine the reality that exists here presently. It is God. It is the Holy Spirit. It is God seeking to move again in the earth. Yes. It's no less a thing than that. And that's why I feel unworthy. That's why I feel, I feel, I feel exactly like Isaiah when he said, Woe is me, there's a woe inside of me. I feel like, I feel like John the Baptist when Jesus descended the slopes of the Jordan. I must decrease. And that's what revival does. It decreases us. And we don't respond to that very readily. I spent 20, I spent half my lifetime in one place now. God took me there. And he held me there. And I prayed and to get away from the situation to leave because there was a steady deterioration of things especially based on what I desired in my heart. Several times I went out on my own and I came back abashed and humiliated to the dust. I came back to crawl into the same place God had held me in for years. 
If there are some of you who are passing through uh, situations of the same sort, be encouraged by this, that all things work together for them, for good to them, who are the called according to his purpose. I don't care what the extremities may be, once God has enlightened you, he is determined to give you the reality of what you have envisioned by the Holy Spirit's illumination. And it's going to take you down a path. You see, you can't have ministry without a history. You are blessed with men and women who minister to you, but few of you recognize that behind that ministry is a history that made it of, of uh, very extreme things. It can't be otherwise. And you young people who are here this morning and you aspire to be used of God and thank God for that which the Holy Spirit does in us in terms of, of laying us bare and saying, Oh God, I do want Thee and at any cost I want Thee. The Holy Spirit puts a price tag on things, so to speak. We should not draw back, but we should embrace what God sends to us. I woke up this morning thinking of the Nazarene who was a carpenter, who served his apprenticeship under his foster parent, Joseph. He had arrived at complete maturity and manhood, and he still wore the apron of his vocation. There sat the old group pot, the crude tools of their craft, and you take a look at that and see how God works in our own lives to prepare us for what he intends to do through us, to safeguard that. and to preserve it and keep it. In conjunction with that, I think of the verse in, I think it's 17 in uh, John, uh, in John 5, where Jesus said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. There is a verse in, uh, in uh, Corinthians 15 which says, First the natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. That represents an inexorable principle. That's a pivotal verse. That's a principle. And so it was with our Lord. It was first the natural. And he served under his, under his foster parent Joseph until he was a competent mechanic. And can't you just see him making an oxen's yoke? And doesn't your imaginativeness go back to that time when he was involved in laboring with his hands? For you see, his father too was a worker, a laborer. And as in the natural, so in the spiritual, my father worketh hitherto. God was the great worker. Elohim, the strong worker the energetic worker. And Jesus said, My Father worketh hitherto in that former creation, in that first creation. And I work in the bringing in of a new creation so that all things shall become new. And I am God's carpenter in the bringing about of newness in the earth.
I associate that with a verse there in the 16th chapter. I'm not trying to really minister. I'm just saying a few things that's floating around in my heart. Uh, I, I think of uh, a verse in the 16th chapter of uh, Matthew, where when he come into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, uh, I don't want to deal with the, all the details there, but he said, uh, when he looked into the eyes of those who were dilated with hate and their faces were flushed with anger, those princes of the church, and he looked into their eyes and he said, I will build my church, this heavenly carpenter, says I will have a house fitly framed together, I will build my church. We're in the process of that. We're, a, we're, we, we're each of us a part of this composite house, the place of God's dwelling. This house that shall be established in the earth and above all kingdoms and governments out of which God's will shall flow from one extreme perimeter to the other the glory of God shall cover all, and the church shall be the vessel through which it will flow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The knowledge of the Lord shall fill all the earth. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail <coughs> against it. Of course, that entailed what Jesus knew was before him, the cross, and the removal of the old creation in that work of his cross. And so it is that uh, Calvary was uh, an integral part of that established work of Christ in building. And I think of how uh, he said this concerning the house that he was building. And by the way, he himself was God's place of dwelling. He was God's temple. And he embodied in his own singular person what he intends each of us shall be, a habitation of God. Singularly, uh, as individuals, and corporately, we are the place of God's rest, of God's dwelling. You see, I can never find rest until I find it in him. And God will be restless until he secures a place where he can dwell in the universe. You know what uh, Stephen said in the seventh chapter of Acts, where he quotes Isaiah, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Then he goes on to say, O oh, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Ye do always resist me, the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do ye. And that's a picture of Christendom today. You ask the average Christian of today why I saved, and he'll tell you, well, I'm saved because I was a sinner, and I was doomed to hell, and now I have been forgiven, and I'm going to heaven. Why? Because the church has lost sight of the eternal purpose. Amen. Because the church is struggling to survive in this world. And they're using every kind of a machination and improvisation to preserve itself, to perpetuate itself. And thank God for those who have a vision of God's purpose and who see the body of Christ universal and for what it really is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, so I think when Jesus 
comes to the 14th chapter of John, uh, he says, in my father's house there are many mansions. See, we lost the impact of that because we've literalized it. And we make that teach the second coming of Christ. That's not it. <laughs> it's a secret coming of Christ. It's the return of Christ to dwell in those who ascended the steps of the upper room and there accommodated God to their bodies as a temple. Praise the Lord. It's beautiful when you see it. Amen. And yet, uh, it's the classic text for preaching funerals. <laughs> and Jesus was speaking to, uh, he was speaking to those who were anything but dead. They were those men who would be living and yet remain after he ascended and was exalted high above all principalities and powers. And he would return to them in the power of his resurrection on the day of Pentecost to make them his body, to make them God's house, God's resting place. Blessed be his wonderful name. Praise the Lord. And God shall have uh, all that he has purposed in his heart through Christ. Yes. And we're living in an hour, and I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. I think dispensations have got us in a lot of trouble, personally. Uh, I'm just not one to dispensate everything God's doing. I was in that for years. And now I'm just flowing with the Lord. Uh, I don't care too much about the word excitement. Uh, it smacks a little of a lot of emotions, and I believe in emotions. Uh, I, I believe uh, in them as an effect, not as a cause. Amen. But I, I'll use it guardedly. I am excited about what's flowing from God, Hallelujah. and particularly in the direction of those who are hungering for Him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. I. I am, I am in your midst here as uh, one who seeks to know the perfect will of God, and uh, I come here not as one to instruct others, I come to learn of you. I come to be taught, not necessarily to teach, and I don't think anyone is deserving of being a teacher if he can't sit down with a little child with a little child and learn something. God has a way of taking all the bombast out of us. Yeah. I used to climb te tent poles and stand on the piano and all these dramatic, all these dramatic antics because you know I'm an old time Pentecostal preacher. And I used to climb those poles and hang with a braille ring. And people would come for miles and miles to see me perform. <laughs> and I was earnest, but I was ignorant. And God had a way of taking that out of me. People in those days weren't so interested in what you said. It's what you were doing while you said it. If you could, uh, if you could vault over three or four pews and run around the church three times, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and get back intact, why they just the house would rock. But what I want to tell you, we are living in a day of quiet power. Have you ever noticed how, when the Spirit begins to move? He mutes us and quiets us until our voices in song are sometimes just a whisper. The reverence of His presence. Hallelujah. How wonderful. Glory to God to sit at His feet completely, completely subdued. But you know, 
that's a thing that has to be maintained. I'm, I'm blessed with, uh, pardon me for my bawling here, but I just couldn't be any other way because I feel that. I'll get over that. The showers will leave, I imagine, and all of that, but uh, uh, I'm, I so appreciate what uh, these brethren are saying in connection with prayer and waiting on God. Now, there are various ways of waiting on God, of course. That doesn't mean stillness and silence all, all the time. We're waiting on God when we're worshiping Him and when we're standing in His presence. We're waiting. But don't be so anxious to assimilate great revelations and trust in the theoretical aspect of things while you neglect waiting on God so you can absorb these things within yourself. Because we have too many splendid theologians today, but not many people who have really being partakers. As Peter says, uh, calling them exceeding. I, I think of that 14th chapter of John and the exceeding great, as Peter describes it, the exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be made partakers of the divine nature. Not just getting the shelves of our intellect well stocked with deeper truths, you know, and developing that idiom so that wherever you go, you can talk about the deeper things. But paying the price in terms of self-denial. And there is nothing that is so, that so denies self as prayer. Because that's the thing you cannot do, is pray. You can only deny yourself and yield to the Spirit who himself is responsible for all of our valid praying. Amen. It has to emanate from God. Prayer completes the cycle. It begins with God. It ends with God. And so waiting upon Him and stillness. You know, we think in terms of a good meeting. I know people will be in a meeting with several thousand and they'll say as they leave and get out, out the corridors of the place, they'll say, wasn't that a meeting? Because of all the sights and the sounds, wasn't that a tremendous thing? But don't belittle the place of lonely waiting upon God. For there is an intake of the divine nature in such a time that you are not aware of. Your obedience, your yielding to God, results in your receiving of Him. Praise the Lord. Amen. I don't know why I should be here. I may give you just a little testimony before I, before I hush up now. But uh, I don't know why I should be here. I inadvertently met Brother Taylor way up in the northern part of Minnesota. Sister Ambrose, you know her, don't you? Some of you do. She's a dear little person in the Lord. And uh, I met her when I was ministering in uh, Toronto at Brother Noon's place. And we had very good fellowship. And she asked me uh, if I should uh, like to come to uh, a retreat up there at Winton, Minnesota. So I went. And there was old Jesuit priests and Dominican priests and sisters from all around Minneapolis. And we had a wonderful time of sharing, and here was Brother Taylor. And, of course, we didn't know one another. We'd never met before. And Sister Ambrose had bought a ticket for me to come up there. And uh, 
So at the conclusion of our uh, time of fellowship in this retreat, which was rich indeed for all of us, uh, I said to Sister Ambrose, well, uh, how shall I get to Duluth to catch my plane? And she said, well, some of the uh, young people here at uh, Winton will take you up. And Brother Taylor overheard it. And he said, you know, Brother Sexton, I'm going to Minneapolis. Why not ride with me? And so uh, I gladly accepted his invitation. And on the way, we began to talk to one another. We weren't comparing notes at all. You know, that's one thing you don't have to do, is compare notes. It's just, it's just that the Spirit of God wonderfully begins to communicate between you. And before I got out of the car, Brother uh, uh, Taylor said to me, you know, Brother Sexton, I think God is directing you toward us. And I acceded to that. I was under no obligation, you know. So I just acceded to it and thought it will never be. <laughs> that's true and I went home and he called me and he said we're going to have a certain meeting at a certain time and I tried to get here and sickness and every conceivable impediment that the enemy could roll up came to deter me and uh, there was like I say all the time a strange aversion inside me not to go. Because I had gotten to the place where I was afraid to go out. I don't know whether you brethren know what I'm talking about or not, but I didn't want to go. I was afraid to go. Because I'd gotten out there, I, I'd gotten out there and felt such an awful absence of God's presence and such a lifting of the anointing because I refused uh, to accept His discipline and tried to avoid it that I just got fearful, and I couldn't go. But we just flowed together. We just flowed together. Without any comparisons, it was just like that. I said it in May when I was out here, and I was testing the water when I was out here. I hadn't committed myself to come here. When brethren prayed for me and said I should come, and, 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 and may I be honest with you, I want only the will of God. If God doesn't want me in Pinecrest, I'll go back to South Dakota and I'll, I'll live and die with the hoot owls and the rattlesnakes <laughs> out there on the prairie if he wants me to. And I must have an indomitable witness inside myself that I belong here. That's all there is to it. That's it. Praise the Lord. And when I came here in May, I, I just had a beautiful time, a wonderful time of fellowship. And just like this morning when I come in here, uh, I, I, all I can do is cry because the Lord's, the Lord's being satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul yes. and be satisfied. Everybody today is wanting to get what God is going to give them. Brethren in the ministry say, come get what God's got for you. Come, let us pray. Let us deliver you. Let us set you free. Well, that's wonderful. But brother and sister, when does God get what's coming to him? And when is the price of Calvary going to met, be met with something equivalent through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? That is it. And you know, the thing, that, I have to say this to you. I, I don't know whether I'm over time or not. Am I way over? Is this going to spoil the lunch? But I, I have to say this. You know, there's such, this is such a beautiful specimen uh, of, of, of God's workings. I don't know whether you know what I mean. But I see in these young people, in your faces, I see in you such a desire, such a hunger for God, and such a susceptibility to the moving of the Spirit. You know... I just wouldn't, I, of course I'm not very knowledgeable, I'm not a world traveler, but dear ones, I wouldn't know where to go and find a, 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 a faction of people like there is here. I mean that. I have never, I have never witnessed it since I left Battleford. 
And I, you know, I come home and I said to our folks, now look, you don't need any leadership up here. You know, I've come from there, and the brethren at Battleford, they didn't, they didn't set up there as dignified uh, officials of the Lord's work. Those meetings were started by the Holy Spirit, and them students just started worshiping God, and they couldn't calm them, they couldn't get them to quit, scarcely could, scarcely could minister the word for the continue. And God has been without worship, real worship, so long that it's become the most important thing in the service of God is to worship Him. Yes. And uh, I did the same there. I just bawled and cried, bawled and cried. I just felt, Lord, oh Lord. I had, I had preached in my church in Moose Jaw and I had a radio broadcast, daily radio broadcast, and I was preaching this revival. I didn't have it in my own church, but I was preaching the coming great revival, the outpouring of the Spirit, the volumes of the Spirit which would be poured out. And a sister sent me a check and told me to go to Battleford. And I flew up there. And I, I witnessed reality there. I heard uh, youngsters, 12 to 15 years old, prophesying with the eloquence of Isaiah. You never heard anything like it. I heard them singing in prophecy, and one sister would get up with a high soprano voice, and she'd prophesy a, a question. And it would be rather lengthy. And it's usually based on, on Israel, of the, uh, uh, and, and it was taken out of the history of God's ancient people. And over here someplace would stand a fellow with a beautiful contralto voice, and he'd answer the question in song. Oh, it was something. It was something. And I was moved by that. And I come home and I said, well, uh, this business of human leadership is all out. Many of the people that went to Battleford threw their songbooks in the alley. I mean that. They came back and the pastor said, songbooks are out. They're not involved at all in what God's doing. We went to all kinds of extremes, you know, to have God's blessing. And I said to my church, I said, in the, the day comes when you people want to revert back to our former ways, you'll see my suitcase on the step, I'll believe it. But little by little, I had to acquiesce to things that did not correspond to that idea. Now, our church at home, the church that I pastor, uh, you know, I'm this kind of a, I'm this kind of a servant of God. I say these things to our people, and we have beautiful worship in our own little group at home. And, uh, but, uh, but when I come here, I I sense the resonating harmony that existed back there. And God is on the move again. Yes. And, and I, I just have to say this to you, and some of you who, who were, uh, some of you heard me say these things last May when I was here. But you see, the thing that caused God to arrest the move of the Spirit was the violation of spiritual principles on the part of the leadership. It wasn't a people generally. It had nothing to do with it. But it was men who got in God's way. And so God has to deal very deeply and thoroughly with those of us who are in ministry. And there has to be, I went right to uh, the brother who was the, I was just a young fellow, young chap at that time. And I went right to this brother who was the head of the, what God had, uh, where God had uh, moved in that place. And I went to him and I said, if you don't relate your own personal life and this thing God is doing to the cross in the deepest way, this will end in the most dreadful debacle Pentecost has ever seen. And our only safeguard where the Spirit begins to move is to embrace the cross, is to go down before God. 
That's it. That is it. Praise the Lord. Glory be to God. Be thou exalted. touches on the portrait of thy life from the hand of the Lord. Thou shalt receive an understanding even in this place for this time 
of the purposes of the Lord for these last days. Now shalt receive an understanding also of the moving and the gathering together of the body in this last hour, saith the Lord. Thou shalt also be confirmed in thy decision, and the Lord shall even guard and minister unto thy family in this place. your presence. Lord, you have humbled us. Yes, Lord. But you have also delighted us with your own person. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Scripture, Brother Joe quoted, interested in me much because the Lord has been speaking to me about Brother Joe. I sat down beside him. The word came three times, each time with the manifest witness of God's presence. The Lord said for Brother Joe Davis, this is going to be a year of entering in. The Lord says that he has set before him an open door that no man can shut. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. A word of knowledge and a word of wisdom. Hallelujah. Praise God. An exercise of his real new creation being. Our ministry is not putting on gifts, but it's ministering out of our essential being that God has made us by his grace. Hallelujah. Yea, the Lord would say unto his people, Yea, this is a day of new beginnings, my people. Yea, for the Lord hath long, long, and long, and long, and long to move in the earth. And the Lord has sought and sought and sought and sought yes. for a people in this day and in this hour. And yea, the Lord shall move in this day. The Lord shall accomplish his purpose in this day. The Lord shall roar in Zion in this day. Yea, my people, the Lord will say, Open up your hearts unto me. Open up your beings unto me. For my spirit doth move in the midst. My spirit shall work in your midst as you open your hearts and your lives unto me. Yea, the Lord shall do in thy midst. The Lord shall do, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah.
one locality, and I say unto thee, my children, sound forth the note that the Lord thy God has put within thy being, and I say again, sound forth. Sufficient and full and reward for all the hours spent in a static state of waiting on God. Ezekiel prophesied and said, The name of that city shall be called, The Lord is There. And by syllogistic reasoning, since the Lord is here, I say, This is that city. Hallelujah. Not conceiving Pinecrest to be unique. We do not want to be puffed up and sectarian. Amen. Brother Eby said it. Sister McClurg told me the last week I taught a class. Brother Sexton has said it. Do not find a place where God is free to manifest like this. The secret is in his presence, in the coming of his presence. The secret is in the wooing of him that he would come. Down in Setauka, I asked God a question. I said, God... I said, Father, how can I maximize the divine content, the essence of God in my life, in the places where I have to minister, because I was sent down there by other wills than mine? Before I had to question fully out, the answer flashed. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. For it's said in the Bible, while they're yet speaking, I will hear, and before they call, I will answer. Before I had to question all the way out to him, his answer had already flashed into my heart. Make his praise glorious. If we build God a tabernacle of praise, he'll move into it. If we're at all sincere, we may be botched up in many ways, but if we're at all sincere, if we build him a tabernacle of praise, he'll move into it. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just read a statement by a, a great... German thinker after Luther. He said, corporeality is the end of the ways of God. Right. All in history moved to a focus where God was manifest in Jesus Christ. And then in the church at Pentecost, he was manifest in that 120. And then he was manifest in 3,000. And then in 5,000. And it's covering the earth. Hallelujah. God lusts to dwell in human society in fullness. Amen. To possess all society and to dwell in fullness. Glory be to God. And declare his wisdom to the principalities and powers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, give us grace to keep our hands off the ark. Hallelujah. God, give us grace not to open the ark and look into it. Amen. To analyze it. Hallelujah. God, give us grace never to light our own fire, an unauthorized fire. Amen. I sense that God has some hard things to say to us this year. Amen. Blessed will he or she be, whosoever shall not be offended in it. Hallelujah. For the Holy Spirit is going to say some of those hard things the disciples couldn't hear. The apostolic church didn't hear. It wasn't heard for these generations. But God is saying it. He's looking for a hearing ear. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.